Welcome to the Asian Society. It's good to see such a bright-eyed, good-looking crowd here this evening. Um, one thing about American politics I've discovered since moving to this great country is a bit like my own country's politics. It's never dull. In fact, you maximize on the interest factor here. And uh, it's been a big day in American domestic politics yesterday. We're all still absorbing that. Uh, but <laughs> the name of the game for the 21st century is what is America going to do in that part of the world which will shape the world's future? And here I speak, of course, of Asia, which is the core mission statement of this great institution, which has been around for a long, long time. And so with this uh, panel, what I propose to do over the next 50 minutes or so before we turn it over to questions to you good folks in the audience is as follows. I'm going to ask our panellists to give us uh, an initial evaluation and some opening remarks about how they see the President's and the Administration's performance in the region generally. And then I'm going to do a bit of a geographical tour d'horizon. I'll start with China, flip through Northeast Asia, down the Chinese coast into Southeast Asia, stopping somewhere close to Delhi, um, before we might end up at that other interesting part of Asia called Russia, and see how that may or may not dovetail into the question which some of you might have in mind, the 9,000 pound gorilla in the room concerning the events of the FBI yesterday. But we'll get there. So starting with the region at large, what I might do is start with the uh, ever provocative, ever interesting, great friend of mine from the Eurasia Group, uh, Ian Bremer. If you're giving this president, in terms of his policy performance and his administration, uh, a mark A to F, as I think you Americans tend to scale it, um, what would you rate him and why? And tell me more broadly in four or five minutes, how do you think he's gone in the region? So um, overall, compared to other presidents, uh, I'd give him a D minus. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I do think that this president is in many ways less capable um, in, uh, in lots of ways, which I can discuss briefly, than, than any president, certainly in my lifetime. But I would also say, compared to the expectations that um, people had of him broadly, the American public, and certainly the mainstream media, the public intellectuals, the elites, I think on that I would grade him considerably better. Uh, I think he has exceeded those expectations, and I'm not sure the mainstream media has necessarily reflected that um, always in their, uh, in, their, in their coverage. I'd probably give him a B if we were covering in that context, so grading on a curve. Um, and, 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 and with the caveat that it's the first 100 days, so we don't know about Comey yet, right? Um, I guess what I would say is that to the extent that Trump is problematic, that Trump is abnormal, that he's abnormal in three ways. There are lots of ways he's normal, by the way. I mean, if you look at, you think about what he is trying to do with the Republicans it, on the domestic side, regulatory rollback, infrastructure, tax. You know, if you squint, you could say, oh, that kind of feels like the stuff we'd see from a normal Republican. It doesn't make a lot, right? But how is he abnormal? I think there are three ways he's abnormal. Uh, the first is that he's abnormally, the administration has, has abnormal levels of incompetence. Uh, there's abnormal levels of corruption and conflicts of interest because of the Trump organization. And there's also abnormal uh, levels of authoritarian impulse, top down. And I think that now that, and, and so the question is really gonna be which of those is, is playing out to a greater degree. And I think that having now the benefit of only 100 days, uh, I would say that of those three, the one that seems by far the most significant is the incompetence. Right? It's the lack of knowledge of how Washington works. It's a lot of people around Trump that aren't really fit for purpose. It's the inability to hire or appoint a lot of people in key parts of the administration. And that's what I think has gotten them in the most trouble. Uh, the fact that, you know, on whether it's the executive order on immigration, which was, could have gone so much better for them in substance, and yet it was so incompetently handled. And I think that the way they took the Taiwan call and then you know, sort of flip-flopped on it, same sort of thing, um, where the authoritarian impulse and the corruption, while they're significant in and of themselves, I don't think they're game changers. And the good news for that is, is the likelihood of breaking institutions over the longer term if the problem is primarily incompetence is really not there. 
In other words, I think that the constraints that reality and the deep bureaucracy of the United States and the media and just right thinking people, several of whom would just quit um, if things got too bad, will ultimately bring Trump either closer to a traditional presidency um, or will ultimately force him out. And I think the likelihood of that is quite low, but it's not zero. That's probably the way I would grade him so far. I'll come back to you a bit later on that because the counter challenge might be Japan relationships in reasonably good shape. The counter challenge might be China relationship after a, an interesting and creative start is currently uh, in reasonable shape. The Taiwan point's been put to bed. If you're sitting in PACOM and you're sitting in the US military, you've got a promise of um, whole new resources in terms of what American forces may need in the region. But we'll come back to that. Um, now, Vali, you're a serious intellectual. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, I think he's setting me up yeah. for something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, in this country, it's still a term of honor and praise. In my country, it's a term of routine abuse. Um, so your take, first of all, just give us the, uh, the uh, A to F rating, if you feel comfortable doing that. But then the why, how do you see the overall evaluation, the overall report card? So building on uh, both what Ian said and what you said, uh, I think, first of all, uh, um, you know, we have to start with the fact that uh, for a very long time, the United States has been the scaffolding, the skeleton of the international order. So uh, looking from outside in, if you're sitting in Asia or any other part of the world and you're looking at, at the United States and you're seeing that uh, a, an, a, a United States that is, first of all, signaling that it's not interested in multilateralism, it's not even very clear it's interested in any kind of bilateral relationship, that it doesn't hold to values that, that has built the world order, uh, and that uh, it sees every relationship transactional, uh, that there's no way in which you don't think that your world is turned upside down. And I think even where you sort of see positive things, like with Japan and, and China, where things are calm right now, so they're not disaster. But if you're sitting there <clears throat> looking at this, you begin to hedge against the world order, that we know it. I mean, you, countries have five-year, 10-year perspectives. Uh, the United States created predictability in the world. Uh, Trump has created, uh, uh, has made the United States the most unpredictable actor in the international order. So I think every country is trying to understand what might come around the corner and how they might hedge against it. And you see this in the kind of questions they make. You see it, for instance, in the cavalcade of people who are coming from all sorts of countries to Washington in order to sort of get a first-hand sense of how things are working out, that, that for the first time, everybody is continuously trying to figure out where they're going. And he's sending still very powerful signals to the world, like uh, you know, lack of interest in trade, lack of interest in big regions of the world. I learned that you know, he cut off uh, uh, the Italian prime minister mid-sentence when he was arguing how Italy and its bases are significant for um, operations in North Africa and Libya, and just sort of said, I don't care about Libya. After which, you know, I, I think the Italian prime minister lost his train of thought. Uh, that's the, the, the talking points. But uh, so I think that's very key. So we, we, we're in an area that even if he doesn't do anything, I think uh, the sort of parameters for everybody has changed. Secondly, he has done, I think, uh, I think as, as Ian said, uh, it's more than incompetence. I mean, I think the institutional collapse in Washington and the changes are, are sort of astounding. Uh, when you look at the State Department or different agencies of the government and you see there's no assistant secretary for Europe, I mean, congressionally approved, appointed for Europe, East Asia, Middle East, South and Central Asia, and there's no deputy secretary of state, the undersecretary is just holding a position. And you think that we're going into a crisis with North Korea and there's no ambassador in Seoul, in Tokyo, in Beijing, or an assistant secretary uh, for uh, East Asia, you wonder beyond the tweets and what the White House says, how actually the work of the government's gonna get done. Who's gonna, be, I mean, Tom sort of has managed this. Who's gonna call embassies? Who's gonna call countries? And so you're, you're worried that, you know, even if things are calm, you're just one step away from a very big crisis. And where there is institutional buildup, I, think, I don't think it's the right kind. There's an over-reliance on generals and colonels. Not that they're ill-meaning, but means that 
you know, that the, the, the tilt of policy is in their direction. So it's going to show up in South China Sea because, you know, PACOM has a much better way of communicating with the top two, three people who are actually making decisions. Uh, there's no senior diplomat. I mean, I think the Department of State for the first time in 50 years is completely uh, absent. And that's worrisome. If I even the person managing uh, uh, Asia in the White House was, 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 a current, was, was, on, was a military guy who, who served like Master and, and Mattis in Iraq. And so you have a cabal that has a particular view of the world and, and, and where there is uh, management, that's, that's the way it happens. And then I think the personalization of decision making. So every country in the world, everybody who comes to Washington, you know, they're not interested so much in going to the State Department. In fact, nobody goes to the State Department. Everybody wants an appointment with Jared Kushner. I mean, the sense is that this poor chap is probably having a meeting from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day. So it is in every single meeting. And that's not the way in which sort of decision making uh, usually uh, uh, takes place. So I think that institutional degeneration actually will begin to sort of uh, um, show itself. And I think some countries, such as North Korea, have taken advantage of this. Because if you have a vacuum of decision making, you could actually push much harder. And then finally, I think everybody's learned now that this administration learns by, by crisis. That really Trump doesn't care about anything until uh, it is actually a crisis. And that's actually a very dangerous precedent because it suggests the United States actually does not have a pro, proactive vision of anything, but it's in a reactive mode. And, and again, if you're North Koreans and you want to you know, get something from Washington at this particular point in time or from Beijing, I mean, the strategy of lobbing missiles uh, in the direction of the United States and Japan makes, makes perfect sense. But, but the danger of all is that we really don't have a handle about who's, how countries are actually gaming foreign policy anymore. How, you know, because, the, because the most sort of obvious, if you would, uh, actor, the one that everybody shaped their foreign policy around is, is right now uh, the most unpredictable one. And I think that's the most dangerous part of this. I mean, what I would worry is uh, we've been really lucky not to have a major crisis so far. I mean, all the crises has, has been created by the administration itself, including the one yesterday. But if we happen to fall into a really major crisis, the United States is completely ill-equipped to deal with it right now. So you see decisions as being personalized. You see them as um, crisis-driven, being the product of uh, the absence of a uh, international strategy on the part of the administration, but your core critique, which you began with and ended, is about an absence of a priority to what has been the American post-war concern, which is uh, sustaining and hand-sitting and being the skeletal structure of the global order uh, and its regional variant. So that's a pretty telling. Is anything good going on? Well, as I said, that we haven't had a major crisis. Okay, that's so, good. So. <laughs> Now, Tom Donilon, you've occupied uh, an office quite recently as National Security Advisor to the President of the United States, uh, currently occupied by General McMaster. It's a nice corner suite, a view out of both windows. Uh, been there a few times. Uh, if you... Um, How did you get in there? How did I get in there? <laughs> <laughs> Australian cunning. <laughs> the, uh, well, usually not to be excoriated, but to be befriended. The... Uh, so you must have some feeling and sympathy for what General McMaster is going through in any regular administration. So your take uh, through that particular lens, but more broadly how you see the administration is going. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, and it, it is, I can, and you do have that perspective, it is a lot easier to, um, to critique than just to manage these processes. You know, mm -hmm. I certainly have earned that during the course of my times in administrations. But uh, having said that, I think Valley makes an important, really important first point which is that the administration doesn't seem to feel compelled to articulate any policies. Uh, you know, and this is a really, really serious problem uh, because uh, it creates deep uncertainty in the world. Um, you know, for example, on Asia, you know, and, and thinking about coming uh, tonight, the only kind of complete uh, presentation that I've been able to find on Asia was an uh, internal presentation that Secretary Tillerson gave to the workforce of the State Department of two or three paragraphs. Uh, and that creates uncertainty. And today, uh, I think that uh, if you think about geopolitical risk in the world, which this group does a lot, um, 
a, a substantial source of the uncertainty in the world is about the United States uh, and where it stands and where it's going to go. Uh, and that's, uh, that's an unusual circumstance for the United States. And indeed, this administration, seems to, at least the president has, seemed to embrace this concept of unpredictability. And, uh, and following on the campaign, where he did call into question really the pillars of the post-World War II order that, the, that was led by the United States in economics and in politics and security, uh, that leads to great uncertainty around the world. And, and this group travels a lot around the world, and you feel that. You know, we're, you know, where are we? What's gonna, if, if we're not going to go with the same, uh, in the same manner, direction, U.S.-led order that we have for the last 70 years, where are we going? I think it's kind of the, kind of the question. Then. And transactions don't do it, particularly in Asia. Uh, where I think it's really important that you articulate to your partners in Asia, especially the Chinese, Kevin, I think you'd agree, uh, uh, the principles. What are the guiding principles that are going to uh, that are going to motivate your policy? Uh, and you, know, you can't really you, you you can't really do that kind of transaction by transaction. That's the first point I would make. That really, the, the approach has generated a great deal of uncertainty in the world, uh, and I think it's a principal source of kind of geopolitical uncertainty and risk in the world today. Second. Um, on Asia, allies have to come first. I think that's a generally important, uh, uh, a generally important kind of first principle of American foreign policy. It's certainly been the basis on which we've engaged the world for the last three quarters of a century. And there's much, much too little emphasis on allies uh, in this administration at this point and not doing the work that needs to be done with allies around the world, including in Asia. I think you're right. I mean, some progress, I think, in a decent relationship developed with the, with the Japanese. But there's been uncertainty among the allies in Asia. Uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, and I think that, you know, Vice President Pence made a trip, General Mattis, uh, Secretary Tillotson, but then you have statements by the president which really, really rocked, I think, the uh, uh, allies and their populations uh, in, the last, in the last just couple of weeks, you know. Um, Korea was part of China. We're heading towards a big conflict with the, with the, with the Koreans. Uh, the South Korean government should pay for the THAAD anti-missile defense system. We're going to call into question whether we should go forward with the chorus, free trade uh, or, uh, agreements. These things that, you know, really are, uh, have rocked allies, right? And, again, I, and we, we're not talking about that region of the world in Europe, but we've had way too much, I think, um, way too little engagement with allies and, and, and a, really a lack of uh, articulation of the importance of alliances and what they mean beyond just transactions uh, in the world by the United States. I think it's a very important a very important point, and it needs to be corrected in Asia because the principal challenges to face in Asia will require partners and allies to address them uh, successfully. The third thing is on, on, uh, on you know, Valley's point on staffing. Um, you cannot take on these challenges without having a government where you have people in place. It's not possible. You know, I, for uh, four and a half years, uh, led the, um, the um, pressure campaign on Iran. Uh, and we put together a global sanctions campaign, which was successful in bringing them to the table. It is not possible to do that without dozens and dozens of diplomats around the world uh, who are working every day on these things. So the staffing issue is a really big issue. And it's not, I don't really think it should, it can't really wait for you to kind of think about the optimal design of the State Department, right? It, particularly given the slowness of our nomination and confirmation process. You could, you, today at the State Department, there's not a single confirmed person except for Secretary Tillerson at the State Department, right? Uh, we could have a situation where these jobs are not filled until sometime next year, uh, you know, going through a quarter of the administration. That's a really serious crisis, I think, in terms of being able to manage, uh, you kind of manage things. Um, fourth, on Asia specifically, uh, and we'll talk about this in some, in some detail, uh, another area where there's great uncertainty is where the administration is going to end up on economic policy, international economic policy. You, know, you had these broad statements during the course of the campaign, that were, and, and, you know, and trade was a real casualty of this campaign, no doubt about that. But what's going to replace the approach? So the president withdrew from TPP the first day of the administration. We don't know what's going to replace it, except some general talk about maybe engaging in bilateral or bilateral free trade agreement with Japan. Okay. Uh, interestingly, in the discussion in this hemisphere about NAFTA, the discussion is what we'll do is we'll renegotiate NAFTA and we'll actually import some of the good provisions from TPP as the next stage of NAFTA, right? You know? Which is, uh, I mean, if, if, if there's been no analysis of what don't you like about NAFTA? You know, what specifically are the problems, right, in NAFTA? And can those problems be addressed through some renegotiation among the 12? Uh, which I think would be a more rational approach. But there really is kind of, a, as Valley said, a pushback against these international institutions. Last couple of quick points on Asia specifically. Um, on North Korea, um, by every measure, uh, every, every dimension, 
is going in a negative direction on North Korea uh, right now. Uh, you know, if you look at the if you look at the numbers of uh, the uh, uh, weapons, the technologies that, that the North Koreans uh, uh, allege to contend that they have, uh, the means of delivery. Uh, in each of these critical uh, areas and critical dimensions of the challenge, the, the trend lines are bad, uh, and it really does need to be. It really does need to be engaged. Now, we escalated this. Uh, the United States did the last few weeks, and then we've kind of taken it off the front pages for now. But we don't really have an articulated policy with respect to that either. And the last thing I'll say about Asia and the administration is that we don't know where the administration is going to come down on the priority of Southeast Asia, uh, which is, I think, needs to be an important part of any comprehensive and successful Asia strategy that's in the U.S. interest. It's interesting what you ended with, which is Southeast Asia. Yeah. And uh, the preoccupation, naturally, because of weapons of mass destruction, the North Korean nuclear program, on the region at large, apart from the Xi Jinping-Trump relationship, has focused on the North Korean nuclear weapons program. That's right. But I read a report just the other day uh, which said that in the first 100 days, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you follow this more closely, but there hasn't yet been a phone call between the president and any head of government in Southeast yeah. Asia. That's a problem. Um, it's a problem if you're in Singapore. It's a problem if you're in, um, in Jakarta. Uh, it's a problem uh, if you're in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and uh, though that we do have an invitation to Duterte, we'll come to that in a minute. Now, respectfully, there was a phone call and a meeting between the president and the prime minister of Australia. And it's not clear that that was preferable <laughs> to ignoring them. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the dinner the other night. Uh, the pr Prime Minister Turnbull was in uh, Washington. And uh, they had a dinner on board the USS Intrepid, yeah. just over there. And uh, the President was a couple of hours late, um, uh, which is, yeah, we're a pretty casual lot in Australia, but that was a little late even for us. Um, he was celebrating the, uh, the outcome in the House of Representatives' vote on Obamacare. Uh, but it, it all seemed to be pretty convivial around the table. Uh, we had thought of just establishing hotlines actually between them on the table so they could speak to each other through the phone <laughs> and put it back together. Back to Northeast Asia, though, and let's try and segment our conversation from here into three broad regions. <coughs> Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and the question which hasn't arisen uh, in the context of the Trump administration, which is India and the enormous diplomacy on the part of uh, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration towards a new strategic partnership with Delhi. So let's just start in the northeast. We've already hit upon the North Korea question. Your evaluation so far, given the Mario Lago meeting um, and uh, the uh, big, shall I say, challenges coming out of that, which is will you actually secure a trade deal between the United States and China, which could work, and the other one out of Mario Lago, which is uh, we, the United States, will now, as it were, throw the hospital pass. Do you have that term in American football? It's the Hail Mary pass. Yeah, okay. Hail Mary. We call it the hospital pass okay. in Australia yeah. because once you take yeah. the ball, you're in yeah. hospital because yeah. you get tackled. <laughs> the, um, uh, on, uh, on North Korea. Some Hail Mary passes are successful, though. Okay. okay. No. okay. okay. Not the Australian experience. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> and so uh, now having handed the North Korean uh, challenge to the Chinese, and both of these exercises, trade in North Korea, having not infinite timelines, um, even as agreed between the two governments, and on, on the nuclear question, there's a finite timeline driven by the technology and the technical progress by the North. So without pointing to anyone in particular, this is sort of open session, stick your hand up and let me know uh, your sense of do we have any possible landing points on these two big, two big issues? Well, you're, first of all, I mean, now increasingly the North Korea issue is not a Northeast Asia issue. So within the next 10 years, the North Koreans could produce a missile that could reach Seattle. And, you know, whether they can actually put a nuclear warhead on it or not, it, it's sufficient, you know, threat that um, it's, it's imperative that their missile program be capped or, or, or reversed and stopped. So, this is now increasingly about the United States, not defense of Korea or defense of Japan per se. I think the problem at some level, and I'm not sure the administration actually appreciates the strategic dimensions of, of the issue, is that uh, if your saber rattling is directed at particularly getting the Chinese to do something, 
the question, the first question is, what is it that the Chinese will want in return? Because increasingly they're, they're solving a, a, a defense security problem for the United States and its allies. So the price is where? Is it in trade? Is it in Southeast Asia? I mean, this is not going to be free. So to, to sort of, you know, la- you know, launch into this uh, sort of China is going to do North Korea for us without actually, as Tom said, a sort of a principal guideline about how are you going to structure U.S.-China relations going forward, I think it's very dangerous because the Chinese will come back and say, okay, we have these options and we can do these certain things, but this is what we want in return from you. And I don't think anybody has thought about what the Chinese might ask and how they might play the game that Kissinger would call linkages. Like Southeast Asia is connected to Northeast Asia and there might be other uh, connections as well. And secondly, to that... Are you inferring uh, that the great South China Sea linkage? Well, S- South China Sea, I mean, the Chinese definitely... I mean, th- that was a place where everybody expected when, when the administration came in, that particularly with PACOM pushing very hard and wanting to adopt some of the strategies that they had on their books of, of running across Chinese lines, you know, uh, uh, making it difficult for them to, to manage these islands... And that with, the, with General McMaster and General Mattis there, that they might have a much more receptive audience in, 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 in putting a lot more pressure on Southeast Asia. Now, the question is that the Chinese are not going to perhaps both do us a favor in North Korea and, and perhaps even assume certain costs and certain risk with the North Korea resolution and also be under U.S. pressure in Southeast Asia. The second issue is that You know, at the end of the day, whatever the Chinese are going to go to Pyongyang to offer the North Koreans and surrender by North Koreans, it's not in the cards. They would have to promise something on behalf of the United States. And I think the best, the very best, best case scenario is that we arrive at an Iran nuclear deal of sorts. And I'm not saying that's even possible. So I don't think the administration has really thought through that you can't scuttle the Iran nuclear deal a deal that the previous administration signed in good faith and the Iranians implemented according to international agencies and you now come and sort of shred it and then you want to go to North Korea and tell Kim Jong-un, why don't you sign another deal with us? And in three years' time, I'm going to rip that too or the next president is going to come and and rip it. And and again, you know, there's a lack of understanding about how even arms control deals requires consistency on the part of the United States. And I, and I think if there's any hope to persuade the North Koreans to any kind of a talk, and you know, the president says he'd be honored to meet with Kim Jong-un. So what, when they meet, ultimately has to offer him something. And the best thing he can offer him is to say this deal that President Obama signed, I'm honoring it and it's going to sit. You can do the same thing and we'll lift sanctions on you just like we lifted lifted on them. So, so I, I think, you know, th- this is not, as, as Tom says, the danger is that I just don't see the strategy that they've put forward uh, is, is, is necessarily going to produce anything. Ian. Yeah. So if you, uh, we'll get to U.S.-China directly a little later, just to North Korea now. Uh, you can take Northeast Asia wherever you want. Okay. So then, well, first of all, I, I, I was going to suggest sending Jared uh, because... <laughs> Uh, first of all, if he can do Israel-Palestine, there's no reason he can't do North Korea. Um, I, I, look, I do believe the, fa- the, the fact that, that Donald Trump could conceivably meet with Kim Jong-un, um, I mean, you know, number one, I mean, it is actually, it does, does mean that there's a greater possibility of a real breakthrough, of, of an actual deal, of an Iran-type deal, because his problem with the Iran deal is mostly the fact that it wasn't a Trump deal. You make it a Trump deal... I mean, the guy gets a Nobel, right? Which I think would resonate with the president, right? right? And he'd deserve it more than Obama if he actually did that, frankly, right? Given what Obama got his for not doing. Um, uh, Sorry, that's just reality. Don't expect me to only go your direction. And what do you want? Um, So there's that. Um, But let me me say, but there's also, of course, a greater possibility of war. Right? I mean, this is like this was a normal distribution, and we now have fat tails, which it could go well, could go badly. I mean, there's a reason why the last several presidents have chosen to pre- present North Korea as a gift for our children to deal with, and it's because it's hard and it's dangerous. And let me at least mention, you know, the fact that, I mean, it, is, is it really an existential risk? Is it really a red line for the North Koreans to be able to hit the United States with a nuclear-tipped ballistic ICBM? I mean... 
if they did that uh, and we didn't, sh- they'd be done for completely. I mean, that's like Israel saying Iran was an existential threat when Israel had 80 to 100 nukes. It wasn't. That was good, pol- it was good politics. It wasn't reality. Um, I mean, to the extent that the North Koreans were going to u- use a nuke against us, you talk to Homeland Security, they will tell you it's in a cargo ship in Vancouver or L.A. or something like that. That's a, that's a whole different kind of problem. They've had that capacity for a long time. They can already, we think, hit Alaska and Hawaii. That doesn't bother us much. I mean, Hawaii, Obama was born there, so I guess it's not part of the United States. But Alaska, <laughs> there's a question with that, right? Um, you know, then you have the, real, the reality that, that North Korea now has the ability, cyber capabilities. I mean, you saw, you know, when hit, hitting Bangladesh and $81 million stolen, apparently close, human error, close to taking a billion. That's dangerous. So, I mean, I do, I do think this is something that needs to be addressed, and it needs to be, um, there has to be real carrot. Because if there's not real carrot, obviously the willingness of the Chinese to make this their problem is not there. Now, I, just carrot, briefly, on, carrot for the Chinese or carrot for the North Koreans? Carrot for North Koreans. Carrot for the North Koreans. Because I just don't think that it's in China's interest. I, I don't think all stick. Given, given the fact that the North Koreans were willing to assassinate the half brother, who, along with his family, was under the protection explicitly of the Chinese government, it strikes me you that didn't they take that as a positive sign. I take that as a, yeah, as a non-positive sign, yes. Um, it, it implies that there is a level of risk acceptance on the part of the North Koreans that makes it dangerous for the Chinese to push them that hard. And I think that the Chinese recognize that as very much so. But for the U.S.-China relationship briefly, just to throw this out since we're talking Northeast Asia, because clearly U.S.-China is one of the things, if you were going to give Trump good grades the first 100 days, U.S.-China is one of the reasons you clearly would do it. Kevin, you made that point. Right. I mean, they ta- he talked originally about currency manipulation, immediately took it off the table. I think everyone recognized that was a smart thing to do. He's calling the Taiwanese and then he says, OK, no, 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 we're not going to change the one China policy. Everyone recognizes in foreign policy. That's a smart thing to do. Then he goes to Mar-a-Lago. Xi Jinping shows up and he actually acts like an adult. Right. And they come away and they end up with a pretty good meeting. Uh, I want to say two things that I think are, are not necessarily conventional wisdom around this. The first thing is I am not in any way convinced that that is sustainable. I mean, remember, Trump couldn't stand Obama. And then Trump, for the first time, goes to the Oval Office, and they meet, and they've got a good photo op, and charismatic. He's like, who knew who's a good guy? He's helping me out. It's great. He called me all the time. We're really helping with the transition. Until suddenly it went badly. And now the man is sick and tapping my phones. Right? And that changed real fast. Do not tell me that can't happen with Xi Jinping, right? Real fast. So, and, and I think that between the challenge of North Korea and most of Trump's advisors who are more hawkish uh, on China on trade than they are uh, more uh, dovish, um, uh, my expectation would be within three, six months, Wilbur Ross's efforts and the North Korea efforts and the Jared efforts with Ambassador Kui are probably not going to meet with success, and so U.S.-China is going to be a much tougher place. Here's the other thing I want to say that's non-conventional wisdom. I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Um, I do believe, if you look certainly at the economic side, American corporations, big corporations, have a much harder time now with access into the Chinese market on IT, on manufacturing, the rest, and they did at the beginning of the Obama administration. And a lot of the ones that were not Trump supporters are pushing the Trump team now to say, give these guys more help. And keep in mind, yes, no one benefits from a trade war, but the U.S. is a hell of a lot bigger and has a lot more leverage. And 10 years ago, we're thinking globalization, we need to manufacture everything in China. Today, supply chains are getting shorter, Chinese labor is more expensive, they don't have rule of law, their, their, their corporations are much stronger and they're benefited by the Chinese government. And there are a lot of U.S. corporations that would like to take a lot of that manufacturing out of China, put other places. So I don't, I don't want Bannon making U.S. foreign policy. But I, I do not think it would, if, I think the fact that Bannon is a seat around the table, making the strong economic nationalism case, and the fact that the Chinese understand that's in the mix, might actually get U.S.-China to a better place. It's risky. Sticking with the status quo is always safer, but not necessarily in our interests over the medium to long term. So I want to, I suspect that that's not something people are thinking a lot about, so I wanted to just throw it out. There's a lot in uh, in that, my friend. I responded just a couple (laughs) Including, uh, Ian is always shy about expressing a firm view. I've known him for a while now. 
quiet, shy guy in the corner. The, um, yeah. Over to you, Let mate. Me about, cause I, I, I agree with Ian's last point, actually. That we, we, have, we have serious economic issues with, the, with, with China that need, to be, that need to be addressed. Let me, get, let me start from the top, though. On uh, China relations generally, we're in a, we, you know, the United States is in a better place today, 100 days in, than it was 100 days ago, when we were going to name a currency manipulator without support for that proposition, when we were challenging the one China policy, when the Secretary of State was testifying in front of the Congress that we were going to blockade South China Sea <laughs> Islands, uh, you know, when we were threatening a 45% tariff, and the list goes on. Uh, and I think the President became better advised uh, with respect to these issues, and they've moved to a better, uh, to a better place. Okay. Um, second, uh, with respect to North Korea, on the threat, um, uh, could you, could you some provocative things, Ian. Um, I, I do think ultimately it, it, it is a threat that we can't we can't ignore for the following reasons: um, the the, uh, the dynamic changes in terms uh, dramatically if the program if their program becomes large, uh, and I think this is, this is an important point because then it goes it goes beyond it being a threat to the region, right? If they develop Nuclear weapons that can be miniaturized and be put on top of a missile of some sort. Uh, if, if it's a threat to the region, uh, we can address it through a variety of means. But the, if the numbers go up, right, you then have a proliferation risk, uh, which I think, and it becomes a very substantial uh, challenge for the, for the United States and for the global community. The third thing is, uh, if, with respect to the size of the program, is that your confidence in your ballistic missile, anti, anti-ballistic missile defense systems go down. Uh, you know, these systems are not built, right, as, uh, as a, as a strate- you know, to, to handle a strategic threat. They're built to handle a tactical threat. So that's where I would disagree a little bit, uh, as you kind of go through, through the scenarios. And that, that's something that the United States would have to, would have to address. A third, um, it's, you know, the question presented is, you know, will China work with the United States? Will China on its own put regime-threatening pressure on North Korea to bring it to the table? That's a big question. Uh, and you know, I don't think we know the answer to that question at this point. I think you'll get resistance from the Chinese to go that far. That's what it will take, I think, to get a negotiation going. I think that's what it took in Iran. It took regime-threatening levels of sanctions uh, to get them to the table. Now, North Korea is a, different, uh, is a different animal. Iran is a large country that wanted to become more integrated into the world. North Korea is a different, is, is not, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, not, it's a, it's a different animal, right? Um, so, uh, that's a big question, whether or not we can get that level. The Chinese will cooperate in that level uh, with that level of pressure. But what it will take is the point I think that Ian was making also, which is that you have to have a promise of engagement on the other end of the pressure. That was, that was a critical part of the Iran approach, right, which is that if, if in fact, uh, you know, we'll pressure you, but there's a point to the pressure, and the point is that we'll actually be available to have a, um, uh, to have a negotiation. Is there a point here where the, the ultimate analysis goes down to two questions? on China, North Korea. One is, is there anything that will actually change North Korea's strategic course, which is to obtain uh, an ICBM uh, and other ranges of missiles capable of providing uh, what they would conclude as being regime-preserving nuclear deterrence? I'll do 30 seconds on this. On the that, second, second one. Yeah. Second, second one as well. Yeah. Yeah. If there is something, and no. it, it goes very much to Vali's point about a gradation of endpoints here, uh, that is, uh, are you talking about preventing them from getting an ICBM uh, you can, or allowing them to get, shall we say, short-range missiles, uh, putting the United States out of reach? But then there's the second point, which relates to the first, which is if that is so, is it sufficiently in China's interest to provide leverage, and if so, what leverage, to obtain that endpoint? Yeah, well, first, um, well, um, with, well, on the second point, uh, you know, it, it has to, China has to be presented with kind of a more of a multidimensional threat here, right, which is basically the United States is going to, um, you know, is going to engage in a series of steps that will make China strategically uncomfortable. Uh, and that has to be, that's, that's, I think, the way that you get to it. You get uh, you know, China to assess its current strategic approach, which has been to have its greatest fear be, be uh, chaos, right, and a, and a fall, a, a regime collapse. Um, so I think that's the I think that's the um, I think that's kind of the, the, the bottom line. Well, before I move to Bali, and then I'll move to uh, Southeast Asia. Sure. So uh, I think one of the things that's has been sort of missing in our conversation, particularly as we put a lot of pressure on China, is it what is it that the Chinese really want in North Korea? What are they afraid of? I mean, if it's chaos, it's one answer. If it is that they are worried about the unified 
Korean Peninsula with American troops and you know a, a, a pro pro American pro Western Korean regime coming right to their border and they see that as a massive strategic defeat. That's a whole different uh, issue. I mean, I, I've heard Chinese say, for instance, you have to start by making making promises, for instance, for Chinese bases in south of the. Uh, you know, yeah. parallel line and, 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 and essentially give them assurances that the unified Korean Peninsula will not be exclusionary towards them. So I think this is something we have to figure out. So we're escalating on the Chinese without actually taking into account as to what is it that they, they, they really want. The second issue is that I think the elections in South Korea should give, give us a pause. It sounds to me that it's a squeaky wheel here. You know, the, the, the threat perception in Seoul is very different than with us or with the Chinese or even with the Japanese. So much, short, much lower threshold than, than a nuclear you know, confrontation could mean a barrage of over 10,000 artillery uh, units in the mountains you know, bearing down on Seoul. And you know, to some extent, this election was also obviously about the Park regime's corruption, but it also happened at a period of enormous amount of anxiety about this escalation. So, you know, you, you, you're, you're escalating with China and with North Korea without actually, as Tom says, engaging with the South Koreans, giving them a degree of assurance. So there's a risk is actually you can escalate this, but actually even the structure of the six-party talks can collapse because not everybody is, uh, is on the same page with a sort of a unilateral Oval Office decision-making here. And, and, and so it might end up being just a bilateral Chinese-American conversation, and, and that can have a very different dynamic. No, I, mean, I think it's really interesting that we haven't talked about Japan yet. Yeah. And before, so before we switch region, you know, the fact that the South Korean government now is going to be much more willing to engage with North Korea, much more concerned about the American THAAD system, the same time that the Japanese government is saying, you know what, we'd like to buy Tomahawk missiles for the first time ever. Yeah. And that's a big deal. And I think that you know Abe, who was the first to come and visit with Trump after Trump won the election, and this was despite the fact that Trump was leaving TPP, which was critical to Abe, he's all in on the United States. The South Koreans are clearly going to be uncomfortable with that. If North Korea gets worse, if the U.S.-China relationship gets worse, the South Korea-Japan dynamic, which is not friendly, um, but is economically very functional, would suddenly become much more challenging. I think the um, great unknown question here is how will uh, President Moon uh, comport himself? Um, the conversation, as we read, uh, between himself and President Trump went well. Uh, we understand that President Moon's keen to come to the United States uh, and accept the President's invitation for a visit. That's good. Uh, we understand that President Moon wants to assure his own constituency, particularly conservative folks who have voted for him, that he can deal with the United States and with his president. And what about the impulses with his own party about sunshine policy number two uh, in dealing with the North? This, for me, is a, is a genuinely moving piece in an already complex jigsaw. Uh, two quick uh, sets of observations, because I'm keen to engage the audience soon. Thoughts of the panel about Southeast Asia. As I said before, it doesn't seem to have figured so far. Um, huge region its own dynamics, and the only uh, warm and friendly so far seem to be between the President and uh, President Duterte, and how in that of itself is then perceived within Southeast Asia. Ali. So one, one way in which the administration may became much more focused on Southeast Asia is, is the perception among many in the security establishment that after the fall of Raqqa and, and Mosul, I, ISIS is going to look for for new uh, um, uh, failed states and, and ungoverned territories to set up shop. We're already seeing him going to Afghanistan. And there's a very strong sense that Mindanao is, is a prime target, and also parts of Indonesia are, are prime target. And, that, uh, and I think that has to do with, uh, with the Duterte visit largely because there's a great deal of worry that the, break, that the breakdown of aid to, to the Philippine military, and, and which is a consequence of Duterte's uh, rhetoric, if, if that happens, it actually will begin to degrade uh, Philippine military's ability to, to police Mindanao. But I think you know, sometime in next year, after uh, sort of ISIS spreads out, 
we may have a much more of a counterterrorism security focus on Southeast Asia. And the countries in that region, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and, and I hope Philippines, are already actually lobbying that, that, that you know, you, we have to sort of pay attention to Southeast Asia. Um, I'm glad you've raised that. That's one of the first pieces we actually put together as the Asia Society Policy Institute last year, which is where does Southeast Asia now go in terms of the outflow of returned fighters. Out of, uh, out of Iraq through Afghanistan into the Middle East, we've seen round one of that, round one of that uh, 10 or so years ago, 15 years ago. Round two will be much bigger. There's more of these folks than there were of the Mujahideen. So your point is really uh, valid in terms of creating a new security basis for U.S. engagement by this president who prioritizes uh, the war against terrorism. Yeah. Tom, your, your thoughts? Just a couple of things. One is, um, is the question presented, as I think, is what's going to replace TPP? You know, we, we had, and, and this was had a big impact on Southeast Asian countries, obviously, some of the biggest impacts are in places like Vietnam. What, you know, what, the United States really lost the leadership edge here when it pulled out of the TPP. Um, it was as much a strategic, uh, strategic issue as it was uh, an economic issue. Uh, and the question presented is what, what, what replaces that? How does the United States make its, make its presence known economically in the region absent the TPP? And there's a competitor for that, right? There's a Chinese advocated competitor in the RECIP, uh, regional um, um, uh, trade, uh, trade approach. And it will diminish U.S. influence, frankly, in the region. So that's, that's, the, fir that's the first point. The second is with respect to the South China Sea. Uh, Valley mentioned this earlier. I don't think there's been a freedom of navigation operation in the South China Sea since President Trump became president. Uh, and that, uh, in, in terms of the signal sending, in terms of the clarity that the United States needs to send with respect to its intention to remain present uh, and a platform for security and prosperity in Asia, that's the kind of thing that needs to happen on a regular basis and the kind of signals that need to be, I think, need to be sent. So there are, there are security issues and there are economic issues. You said you know, that um, we haven't seen a lot of diplomacy with respect to ASEAN at this point, Southeast Asia. Uh, Secretary Tilson didn't meet with the foreign ministers. Uh, you know, the question presented next is, I think, what role will the president play with respect to EAS uh, and making himself a part of that, you know, kind of the fabric of that region? President Obama made that a big priority. And I think to, to, uh, uh, to uh, important and positive effect. So you've got economic issues, security issues, and diplomatic issues uh, in Asia, which I think need to, have, need to have the attention of the administration. You can't really have an Asia policy uh, without having, um, you know, we talked about a rebalance to Asia, without also having, I think, a rebalance within Asia to having a lot more focus in Southeast Asia. I, I agree with that. I think that most um, of the Southeast Asians would have argued that that rebalance by the end of the Obama administration wasn't present. Mm -hmm. The Philippines, President Duterte had already basically flipped on the United States publicly well before Trump was elected. Singaporean Prime Minister was deeply upset, had penned, you know, sort of op-eds and the rest um, that, you know, the United States was not providing the kind of leadership that was required in the region. Certainly with TPP's now failure, the alternative appears to be TPP without the United yeah. States, which is now gaining momentum, uh, which is interesting. And, uh, you know, it, it's better than nothing. It's a higher standard deal than what you have with RCEP, which is China-led. But it's uh, clearly going to be a hit to the U.S. economy uh, of some substance if the U.S. isn't in it. Um, I think the other thing that we haven't talked about yet um, is the fact that um, one of the reasons why Trump's relationship with Duterte is good is because Trump, the Trump Organization has a lot of business in the Philippines. And uh, the Philippine president appointed um, the Trump Organization's lead partner from the Philippines to be their special envoy to the United States. After the Trump election, he immediately showed up in New York, met with Ivanka, met with Jared, but it was not an official visit. Um, it was as a businessman, even though he had a, a position officially from the president. And you do see the desire of a lot of countries here to say, hey, what do we need to throw at these guys like economically, directly, so that they're going to work more closely with us. That's something they're used to, right? It, it makes sense for them, uh, but it does put us at their level. I, I had an interview the other day with the lead journalist in Washington from Kaishin, uh, you know, the, the, basically, the, the, I guess, the economist of China. And she asked me this question that depressed the hell out of me because she said, well, you know, the, uh, the fact that, the, that my government, the Chinese government, just gave all these licenses to Ivanka for uh, her clothing lines in China uh, do you think that's going to improve the relationship between the U.S. and China? Mm -hmm. And um, I said, number one, clearly there is a reality to that perception. 
Um, in, in other words, people will perceive it whether or not it's true. Number two, um, at the very least, it's going to provide more access, and that always matters. That was a Clinton Foundation problem, and it potentially could actually move the decision-making process. Um, but number three is that this is a very smart thing for the Chinese government to do, precisely because it really undermines one thing that the U.S. had going for it for so long, which is that actually our values matter. They're different. And in many cases, they're actually better. Um, even though we can be hypocritical, we don't always implement or execute on them well. Then nonetheless, you can't compare like American standards on these things to Chinese standards or Southeast Asian standards. And I think this is one where a lot of what the Southeast Asians look to the U.S. for, they now look to us less. And I can't remember if it was Valley, if it was Tom that mentioned originally that the United States looks a little different because we're not doing the same things. I think it was Tom on security and politics and trade. That's true. But I think the one that we don't talk about as much is the fact that the United States has for a long time been kind of abdicating to a greater and greater degree on our willingness to promote our values internationally. And I think that's basically been fundamentally destroyed with the Trump administration and is going to hurt the U.S. and Southeast Asia. This is a really powerful point. Uh, and that, you know, uh, you know, the way uh, Ian describes his conversation with this reporter, right, you know, which is basically what do we need to do to get on the right side of this thing and how do we do it through... You know, basically favors and things like that. That's the way politics is practiced in a lot of the world. That's not the way the United States has led the world since World War II. Uh, it's certainly not the way we've led in Asia. Uh, and the example of the United States has been important for the internal politics of these countries in terms of their development as democracies, right? It's been important for them to develop uh, in terms of their uh, economic development. Uh, and to lose that edge, to lose that leadership role is a really important blow to United States leadership in the world. And I think the regions of the world will be worse off for this. You know, the, the, um, you do a, do a thought experiment. Uh, if uh, the United States hadn't engaged in the way it's engaged, both in terms of its security uh, assurances, its presence, its economic ideas, and its values ideas, think about what Asia looks like. Uh, since World War II. It doesn't look the way it looks today, frankly. You don't have the economic development. You don't have the qu qu kinds of governments you have today. You certainly don't have the democratic development that you've had in Asia. I think Ian's point is a very powerful point. It's about to turn to a sad point. Thank you um, for uh, that. Uh, can I um, now go to the audience? Uh, our time's ticking away. I haven't touched India. I haven't touched Russia. And I haven't touched uh, a three-letter word called the FBI. Um, <laughs> And uh, being not an American, I don't even know what that institution does. So um, Kevin, I'm going can I give you some advice? You want to keep it that way. Okay, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, uh, thank you for that uh, rejoinder. The, so I'm going to take some questions from the audience. Uh, and, uh, but I am going to come back at the end to ask for some comments uh, from our panellists, including on the, the Russia question uh, and the stuff which is most recently in the news on the FBI and Comey and the rest, because it does affect the overall debate on America and the world. So, over to you. That's you. Now, have we got um, a mic to uh, throw at this gentleman? And please uh, state your name, rank, and serial number, and, uh, and uh, who you are and where you're from, and keep the question short. I'm Zach Dykewald. I'm an author for St. Martin's Press and a consultant at the Dylan Schneider Group. Um, first, thank you so much for the conversation tonight. It was really fascinating. I will say, though, we had a somewhat calamity-driven conversation, and it does feel like there are, we're sort of dodging crises. There's a lot of talk before President Trump took office about the opportunity that, we, that would be provided to China um, in terms of power voids, in terms of lack of leadership in the region. And I'm not sure if 110 10 days in, we haven't really talked about this. So from, from where you sit, um, what do you see as the opportunities from from China's perspective in the region now that we're 110 days in of Trump leadership? Okay, I'm going to take a couple of questions, and I'll take a bracket of three, and then I'll throw it back to folks who want to answer it. So thank you for that, sir. And straight behind you, actually. We'll play past the parcel. Hi there. James Reinald, Middle East Eye. Thanks again for the uh, conversation. I'd like to ask you briefly about two other um, allies, also in Asia, I guess kind of loosely, and those are Saudi Arabia and Israel. Obviously, Trump had meetings with senior officials, Netanyahu and others, during his first 100 days, and it's the subject of the president's first foreign trip. He's going to Saudi Arabia and then to Israel. Obviously, people are asking a lot of questions about whether or not he's going to boost support for the Saudis war in Yemen and what he's going to do on the peace process and possibly move an embassy to Jerusalem. I'd love okay. your comments on those. That takes us to West Asia. Asia Society, we have a UN definition of Asia. 
as I always say, Tokyo to Tel Aviv, all points in between. Um, one other question. Uh, I'll take this other one down the front, sir, and then we'll move up the, uh, towards the back. Sir. So we've got China, regional opportunities, um, Saudi slash Israel, sir. Um, I was wondering, thanks, guys, wondering um, the extent to which and how countries, you, you talked about hedging, how countries in Asia, and I'm thinking principally about India, Australia, and Japan might start taking matters into their own hands. Do they get together? Does Japan get nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, trilats uh, minus um, Uncle Sam. I'll leave with those three so we don't lose them. Uh, anyone want to take any one of those in particular? Uh, I'll take the China one, sure. China one? Okay. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, we got a little bit at this uh, when we were talking about uh, TPP and what happens post-TPP. Um, I think that there is, I mean, you think about the fact that the Chinese right now are the only country in the world of size with a global economic strategy. And they're writing checks. There's a One Belt, One Road summit coming up in the next few days. I'm speaking at it. And, oh, well, then. <laughs> Before you attack. So much for dinner next week. Yeah. I don't know what's going on with that. But, uh, it's on Sunday. Okay. Um, so, um, the, uh, the, you know, you've got the, the Chilean president, the Argentinian president, the Italian prime minister, uh, and a lot of ministers from around the world that would love to see better engagement with the United States. But absent that, they're looking at China and saying, we're going to work more closely with you. I see this in South America everywhere. I mean, our, I see it, you know, you, you, the, in Peru, uh, when, uh, when the Peruvian president was uh, hosting the APEC summit, and he has roughly equivalent, uh, you know, sort of relationships uh, trade-wise with the U.S., the EU as a block, and with China. He's an economist, a Western economist by training, and, and he basically was saying, look, um, we want to work with the U.S., but you're just not there for us, and ultimately we're just going to be pushed to do more and more and more in China. And that means over time, you know, not only more trade, but their standards, right? Um, and that's, when, when they give money, they're not trying to make you into a liberal democracy. They're trying to get you to buy stuff from their state-owned enterprises. One Belt, One Road isn't just about it putting in infrastructure. It's also about exporting a lot of their manufacturing base to other countries, too. Over the long term, this is a big opportunity for China. But let's keep in mind... China wanted to do this quietly and under the radar more incrementally because unlike Russia, the world is heading towards China over time given the size, the growing size of their economy to the extent they maintain political stability. They really believe they had more time. They are unnerved by the fact that the sudden withdrawal of the United States into unilateralism um, means that China, there's a lot more scrutiny and a lot of things that require other countries' involvement that the Chinese, frankly, aren't particularly ready for. So I think it's a double-edged sword for China. I think that, leaving aside like the North Korea crisis, other things, I think that even the fact that there's more space for China to move into is not something they purely view as a positive at this point. Ali, Middle East stuff. So just, just a quick uh, addition to what Ian said. Uh, you know, also what's been, what the Trump administration is gonna do to the World Bank, for instance, matters a lot to AIIB. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an open question whether the World Bank will even get half of the uh, uh, capital that it has committed to projects uh, around the world. And many more countries are going to look to the Chinese, to the One Belt, One Road, to the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, at least in the next couple of years, which will give them a lot more leverage uh, 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 across Asia and beyond. But on the Middle East, first of all, uh, Saudi Arabia is also, uh, Israel is obviously there's a lot more continuity in American policy towards Israel. I mean, President Trump has said he's going to move the embassy, but at the same time, he's the first American president to publicly, in front of the Israeli prime minister, criticize the settlements. It's not very clear, you know, uh, where is he going to go with that. Um, but I think with the, 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 there's a greater deal change on the, on the Arab side of this. So Saudi Arabia's engagement is not very different from the Chinese. So the very first meetings that uh, Mohammed bin Salman had in Washington was all about uh, Aramco's IPO being floated in the U.S. And, and $100 billion being committed to creating jobs in the U.S. And so, again, you know, it's, it's what, you can, what, what you will do for me. And, uh, and, and it's paid off. You know, there's the Saudis. Uh, I think the biggest, the most important outcome of this sort of uh, the way this trip is being structured, as President Trump has decided that it's, it is Saudi Arabia rather than Egypt that is the center of Islam. So he's going to engage the Muslim world in 
Saudi Arabia rather than in Cairo, which is where President Obama started uh, the engagement. But, but the key problem uh, with, with Saudi Arabia going there is that what the Saudis really want and their allies is basically to undo the Obama administration's uh, Middle East policy, which was a um, less engagement in the region, uh, neutralizing Iran through the nuclear deal and, and others, not getting involved in wars in the region, and then basically encouraging the Saudis to talk to Iran. I mean, the, the, towards the end, the Obama administration uh, pressured Saudi Arabia enormously to talk to Iran. I mean, the President Obama showed his hand in an interview with Jeffrey Goldberg where he said you should share the region. So when last week when Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the, the Deputy Crown Prince, in an interview said we will not talk to Iran, period, essentially was making a very big statement that, that we don't have, that policy of American pressure is not there and we don't have to talk to the Iranians and we will not talk to the Iranians. So it was actually a very clear snob to the American policy. But what the Saudis want from, for the United States, I think it's, it goes against the grain of much of what, uh, what uh, President Trump said on the, on the campaign trail. A, they want the United States to reverse whatever progress there was with Iran, go back to the Bush era and before of containment strategy with Iran. To, uh, um, you know, when, when they talk about Iranian bad behavior in the region, it's really a code word that you should do the fighting in Syria and Yemen in order to defeat Iran and force them out of the region, which means much more military presence by the United States uh, in the region. And then essentially going back to a, an old policy of, of uh, an American-Arab alliance against uh, particularly, particularly Iran. And then there's now obviously an access of possibility of a Saudi or an Arab-Israeli component uh, here as well. But all of it essentially means back to the Bush era. Uh, now, that's what President Trump said he would not do in the campaign trail, but on the other hand, he's hired a lot of people who are veterans of that time period, and that's their inclination is to do this. So, uh, you know, I don't know what to take from his going. I think the biggest danger of, of his traveling to Saudi Arabia is that he may, after an hour of, you know, fabulous meeting or dinner with Mohammed bin Salman and King Salman, come out and in front of them say something that could be escalatory in the region. That's what they would want for them. I mean, that kind of captive audience with the president these days is actually a dangerous, is a dangerous uh, proposition. Oh, yeah, a couple of things. One is the, um, you know, with respect to China, the, the U.S. retrenchment in Asia, uh, and we can debate the uh, efficacy of the rebalance and how far it went, whether, but, but, but a, but a but a determined retrenchment, right, from Asia is a gift to Chinese regional policy uh, and would um, be directly in service of China's, one of, China, one of the key pillars of China foreign policy. And I think we're in, we're in a danger. And also, if you have, if you, if you have policies that um, um, uh, allow allies to be uneasy about your commitments, right, you know, of course the countries are going to hedge. Uh, that's, what's, that's, a, that's a natural dynamic, I think, in international relations. Um, I also think, I, you know, it's an interesting question Ian, about the pace at which China seeks to or feels comfortable filling a kind of global uh, leadership vacuum. But uh, they'll, put, they'll fill some of the vacuum pretty soon. We saw that. We saw that at Davos with the presentation that President Xi gave in Davos, really kind of a champion of international cooperation, globalization, and, and fighting climate change. They'll fill vacuums, I think, on a kind of a on a, you know, on, a, on a determined basis, right, kind of one by one. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think it's uh, um, notable value that the first trip abroad of the President of the United States, right, in office is to Saudi Arabia, uh, not to an ally. Uh, the allies are third on that trip, right? You know, he's going to go to Saudi Arabia, Israel, and then go to the NATO summit uh, in Brussels. And I think it's met to underscore the headline for their priorities uh, with, respect to the, with respect to the administration, uh, which is uh, to... Uh, confront Iran and the battle ISIS uh, and try to pull together a coalition in the region to do that. I think that you'll see them um, uh, stress the uh, willingness to confront Iran in a much more direct way than the Obama administration did, uh, particularly to, address, to confront Iran outside the four corners of the nuclear deal. Uh, unfortunately, that, that can... Do you think you'll kill or keep the deal? Well, I, that's, you know, it's an interesting question. I mean, the, the, uh, not just the uh, international community, but the United States certified last, last week that Iran had been um, 
complying with the terms of the deal. It was immediately followed by a very tough statement from Secretary Tillerson and from the, and from the White House with respect to Iranian behavior and the deficiencies of the deal. Um, it's not clear. I think, I think at this point, you know, the advice that he'll get, I think, throughout the region would be to keep the deal. He'll certainly get that advice from, um, from the uh, group that put together the deal. Uh, but it, but uh, the, the Trump administration will be much less protective of the nuclear deal with Iran than the Obama administration was. I think Valley's right about that. And he will have, I think there'll be, uh, the Iranians provide plenty of opportunities for confrontation. And I think we have, uh, there's, there's a risk of, uh, there's a risk of escalation in the region. Do you region, think the frankly. Saudis and the Israelis, sort of voce, will say keep the deal? Well, I don't know what they'll say, sort of voce, you know, but, but they, I think that uh, if you ask, uh, uh, if you ask most of the um, kind of professionals, for example, in Israel, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, of course, opposed the deal loudly. Uh, but if you ask the intelligence and military professionals in Israel, I think to a person they would tell you that, in fact, uh, that getting a decade and a half or so here of uh, space with respect to the uh, uh, freezing the Iranian nuclear program is to their advantage. Let me just add a two-point. You disagree with uh, no, absolutely. I mean, the, the one is that they have, a, they have a policy review on Iran, which has been not come to a conclusion. I mean, they're just sort of punting it. So we don't know what they will decide in the end. Secondly, that the Congress may actually push for, for uh, dismantling the deal. And, and then the question is whether the president is willing to veto it if, if something comes up. And the third, I think, to, to Tom's point, is that you could, you could keep the deal but violate or, 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 or scrap the American part of it by putting all those sanctions back for, for other reasons. So, you, so technically, the Iranians are bound on their side. You are not bound on your mm -hmm. side. And remember, the, the American sanctions are suspended. Mm -hmm. They were not revoked, exactly. right? And the suspension has to be affirmed by the president every six months. And with but, the exception of the self-imposed crisis on the um, uh, immigration executive order, there's been really no news on anything big and Muslim yeah. for the first few months. So God forbid how this reacts when suddenly there's a significant terrorist attack either in the United States or against U.S. assets abroad. I do think that there's a vulnerability that this is, an, you said at the beginning, the ability of this government to react or overreact to crisis and therefore denormalize is fairly high, especially when, you know, you've got the infighting. This is the most gossipy administration, <laughs> right? This whole McMaster's war thing and Afghanistan is McMaster's war, I mean, you know, again, it's not gonna be popular. It's not popular to send people over there. So if they end up getting more troops and it goes badly and they blame them and Trump in a fit of pique wants to throw them under the bus, uh, you have a different dynamic of the people that are making this pause. I think with this dynamic, without a crisis, the Iran deal looks pretty good to me. Mm -hmm. But their commitment to it, if they start getting shaken domestically or internationally, it's a very different story. Another round of questions, please. And I'm looking for some women in the audience. Uh, lady here, lady up there, and this young lady here in the green. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mina Yi Merazaldi. I am from the Flint Company in Philadelphia. And I find this discussion obviously very, very insightful and I'm very grateful for it. My question is with regards to the two Koreas and the, uh, uh, the president-elect, uh, President Moon Jae-in's particular policy of engagement with North Korea, uh, so-called the uh, Sunshine Policy too. And within the last couple of hours, I, termed, uh, I heard the, uh, the new term called Moonshine Policy, which I like very much. Um, so by engaging directly with North Korea, if the two Koreas decide at some point, rather than going after the failed policy and, and wishful thinking of unified Korea, if they elect to do, for instance, exchange of diplomatic relationships and start talking about sending ambassadors to each other's countries and capital, what are the realistic obstacles to that approach? And would United States support something like that? Um, and I suspect, obviously, there is a great deal of policy change that needs to occur. But I think we have a great deal of hope that the situation in Korea could potentially change for the better for all of us. And 
I would like your input, particularly Tom, if you may. Um, if the two Koreas independently decide that they would like to have diplomatic exchange begin, okay. would that be possible Got in the near future? Need to get some other questions in. Thank you for that. Um, now the lady in green who's just behind you there. Flip it back. Thank you. Um, hi, so I'm Katarina Witsa. I am a PhD student, so I'm from a scientific background. Um, mine is also a question about North Korea. So we have a country that is, from what we can see, firing a lot of missiles as being like actively aggressive, but which we know very little about internally. And so granted, North Korea is at least, if not more, unpredictable currently than the US political situation. But um, what I'm wondering is whether you really believe that the country has enough money to sustain a nuclear program um, or indeed to sustain itself for the time which it will take to, to develop a nuclear warhead. Okay. So thus far we've seen... Okay, got that. Can I freeze it there? Okay. Thank you. Got the uh, question. Okay, sorry. Yep. I'm just trying to keep, keep the action rolling. That's all. Uh, lady up the back there. So two North Korean questions and... Yeah. Good evening. Um, can you hear me? Oh, yes, you can. I can hear. Absolutely. But um, I'm a permanent resident, and I'm sorry, a resident alien. But anyway, I love America. And one of the things that is really worrying for me about this president is his... the fact that he twitters... I don't mind so much, but it's five o'clock in the morning, so it's usually twittering, perhaps the Far East or Europe or whatever. But I wondered if there's any degree of um, unpredictability that could be grounds for impeachment. This is the 25th Amendment question. Okay, I think you got it. Uh, we've got three questions there, one 25th and two North Koreas. Um, Inter-Korean normalization, I think, was one over here. Is it possible? Uh, what would the American reaction to it be? Two, is it financially sustainable for them to actually obtain a nuclear uh, capability? And thirdly, um, the 25th Amendment. <laughs> you, know, you know you want to answer the 25th Amendment. I know that you were the one person named in a question, so you get to start. So you get the one, uh, you're doing the 25th right, Amendment. <laughs> Uh, a couple of points. One, with respect to, you know, uh, I'd say three or four things. Number one is, uh, uh, you know, we've been waiting for the North Korean regime to collapse for a long time. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it hasn't, uh, you know, and it, and it, you know, it basically uh, is a, you know, is a, um, is a mob kind of run organization, right, that is that, uh, in a police state that will do everything it can to kind of support the, con the continuation of the family rule in, uh, in North Korea. Um, you raise an important question, though, about the uh, long-term viability to economically under pressure. Uh, and my point, the second point I would make is this, is I think there's a lot more space for economic pressure on North Korea than we've exercised to date. Uh, you know, we haven't really, I think, gone anywhere near the kind of pressure we could, uh, which would, again, as I said earlier in, my con in the conversation, confront them with kind of a regime-threatening kind, of kind of situation. You know, we really haven't engaged in uh, serious interdiction efforts we haven't really engaged in the kind of secondary sanctions effort that the United States could en did engage in with respect to Iran and could engage in with respect to, uh, with respect to North Korea. And all those things need to be tried, I think, um, in, terms of, in terms of pressure. You know, Kevin, you, you said earlier, you know, is it realistic to think that at some point you could succeed in this effort to denuclearize de the, uh, the peninsula? Uh, you know, that's, that's obviously the, the $64,000 question. But given the threats here, right, we certainly need to try all this. Uh, you know, and, uh, and because we have a situation today uh, where North Korea uh, has a, uh, uh, you know, demonstrated a mastery of, the, of uh, nuclear explosions, um, but they are short of the ability to deliver them in a way that would threaten the United States uh, in a direct way. And we should undertake everything we can, I think, to try to keep it short of that. Uh, and ultimately, that would have to be a sit-down conversation with the Koreans. You know, with respect to um, unification, uh, the United States has been supportive of unification efforts in uh, 
uh, on the Korean Peninsula. That would be something we'd have to work closely, obviously, clo in close consultation with the South Koreans on. Um, uh, it's, there's a long way to go, though, uh, given, the, given the type of regime that we face in North Korea, uh, uh, Korea today. Lots of obstacles that would take a long time to go through, but you know, the major one is the leadership dynamic in, uh, in North Korea. And they uh, know um, there's not an iota of evidence at this point that uh, Kim Jong-un uh, and the ruling elite in North Korea are prepared to give up uh, anything like uh, they'd have to give up in order to have a reunification effort underway. I think we're a ways from that. Vali, North Korea. Just before we go to, uh, so, you know, if, if you look, if uh, countries who are, who are in the situation of North Korea and Iran was there, if you looked at the examples of Libya and Iraq, you would think giving these things up without actually resolving everything else is actually foolish. And the lesson I think that Iran learned in 2003 when they negotiated a nuclear deal that then the Bush administration did not agree when they had only 120 centrifuges. They concluded that you actually are not going to get a serious negotiation unless you have thousands and thousands of centrifuges. So if you, uh, that's the only thing you have is your threat. Uh, you know, that, that's, there's a price to that. So, so you ultimately will go to the table when you can get the most amount from that threat. And it almost can come a game that, that in order to get all the sanctions lifted or significant amount of the sanctions lifted, you actually have to escalate your threat. I think what's interesting with the North Korea situation is that you know, you know, we're reaching that point that the, that the United States may actually look at, OK, we're going to have serious negotiations. But there's an incentive for the North Koreans to become more aggressive and to continue to build, because then they will get more more from the United States and the West for, for giving that up. So, that, so there, is, there, is a, there is an element of, uh, of gamesmanship uh, when it comes to, you know, you lift the sanctions if I give up my threat, uh, and then you have to sort of calibrate what's the value of your threat. So as we draw this evening's discussions to a close, and we started 10 minutes late, so we'll go 10 minutes later, um, the uh, 25th Amendment, should it apply to Kim Jong-un? We can't get rid of him with the 25th Amendment? We can't. Okay. The 25th Amendment as it applies here in the United States, that was the question up the back. But more broadly, as we go through this last uh, bracket of observations, uh, your thoughts on uh, the President, uh, uh, Comey, Russia? I will, I will say briefly in response to Tom's piece, I do think everything should be on the table and considered vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. But I do think that anything that would potentially threaten, that would actually be regime-threatening, clearly has potential downside yeah. for us. And so therefore, I, I do not take it as, uh, a, as, as on its face that if we have potential sanctions, cyber measures, and others that would potentially really push the North Koreans, that, that is necessarily a smart policy implement. I'd want to debate it, but I wouldn't necessarily say that. Uh, and I think we get pushback from a lot of countries, uh, from our allies in the region. The one thing I will say is our, our policy on North Korea is clearly an America first policy in the sense that it is clearly not a South Korea or a Japan or a China first policy. I think that's very clear, and I think our allies are worried about that. Um, but you have to, you, and which is why you have to provide the ramp to negotiation absolutely. during the course of the, of the course of a pressure absolutely. campaign. Yeah, and I'm yeah. hoping that that's it something... Can't, that, as you said, it can't be all stick. There, ha there has to be, yeah. the, 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 the dynamic has to be, we're going to take the pressure to an extreme level, but there is a way to, you, you know, we have a purpose. For the, for, the, for the pressure. Yeah, the reason I'm a little bit more, that I think it's a little different than Iran, is because in the case of Iran, I thought there was a, it was a lot of things we could do to Iran yeah. before there was really an internal threat that it could fall apart to make them lash out. So there was, it felt like there was more buffer around offering the carrot and the stick, where in the case of North Korea, given how little we know and how totalitarian they are, I do think that the potential fat tail downside yeah. with pushing them harder yeah. is graver. That's an important analytical point, because, and, and we have a 50-year history of them doing outrageous things. Those things, yeah. yeah. So uh, and we could be risking a lot of South Korean and Japanese lives um, and some American soldiers in the region. Um, I, I don't know on, on the, I mean, I guess the Comey stuff, uh, we had a little conversation amongst ourselves uh, in the greenish room uh, before this. And I, I know that the panel agreed that the Comey firing was the biggest mistake that the Trump administration has made to date. Uh, there's still plenty of time to improve upon that. Uh, but in the 110 days, um, and, and it's not because everybody loves Comey, um, though we obviously like him a lot more now that he's gone. Um, but but it, it is because um, the process, the temperament, 
um, the believability stinks. Stinks to high heaven. Do I think that this is impeachable? Um, in reality, no. Uh, and I don't, you know, first of all, because impeachment's not a legal process, it's a political process, and there are Republicans that control the House and the Senate. Um, and, the, and President Trump, as of last week, had greater support from the Republicans in the United States than any president in 100 days since Carter from their own parties. Now, he's getting destroyed by independents and Democrats, but that's still very different. If you are in the House or Senate, are you going to risk your own political neck for Trump, uh, to go against Trump? And I think the answer to that for the vast majority of them, I mean, okay, not McCain, not Lindsey Graham, but for the vast majority of them who are in more normal positions in their seats is that you're not. Um, so I think in that regard, I think Trump feels relatively safe that he can kind of run rampant on this stuff and that ultimately the Republicans are going to have to do what Paul Ryan did, which is like, yeah, it's concerning, but the president did what the president did, right? Uh, so in other words, concerning, it doesn't mean anything. But, but I think that tr what Trump has done, at the very least, is he's cut off his ability to get Democrats to work with him on things like tax. And so, because the Democrats, I think, now see a much better opportunity by going after him on everything that they can actually gain seats, maybe even majority in the House in 2018. I think he risks a few Republicans in terms of support over the course of the coming months. And obviously, he just puts an enormous distraction that's gonna make everything else harder and take a lot longer to get anything done. And plus, you talk to anybody outside the United States, and this gets back to the point Tom and I were talking about, the credibility of the U.S. It's just embarrassing to represent the U.S. outside the U.S. right now. And in some cases, like Canada and Mexico or Japan, Israel, they don't have a choice, so who really cares? But a lot of countries do have choices. And, you know, you don't want to have to give a speech to a thousand people in another country and start by saying, I'm sorry. That's not... <laughs> I mean, they laugh, it does get that response, but, it's, but they're chagrined at the same time, and it's sad, and we don't want that, and we're gonna have at least four years of that, and possibly even eight, and I think that that, I know, it's Manhattan, I know, but, but, but if you leave aside your very narrow provincial perspective on this, um, the fact is that this is gonna be challenging. Most Americans don't care about foreign policy, we know that, the numbers are going up over time, but they still don't, and, you know, the United, the United States has a lot of room to go to embarrass ourselves and to fritter away a lot of our influence globally before this starts to bite us in the ass domestically. Vali, concluding thoughts. You're not from the People's Republic of Manhattan. You're from the District of Columbia. Well, the mood is uh, in, in Washington is even more dour, because, uh, particularly because, uh, you know, everybody who's engaged in the foreign policy world sees this uh, sort of movie on a, on a, up close on a, da on a daily basis. And... Um, you know, it's, as, as Ian said, it's very difficult to be, to be optimistic, but, but I still think, you know, the point that he makes about the credibility of American foreign policy, about uh, countries ultimately begin to formulate foreign, even, even allies begin to doubt our ability to execute, our ability to make decisions. They may not make moral judgments about us in Israel, in Canada, or Mexico, or, or those sorts of countries, but they still are doubting our ability to make coherent policy, follow up on policy, and even what the Trump administration makes in policy, there's, if, you don't, if you're not sure he's gonna be there two years from now, or four years from now, is it this eight years from now, the question is how seriously will you take these policies? And I think that sort of there's, at best case scenario, we see a lot of wait and see uh, attitudes, and at worst is that people begin to actually create structures around. So I think to Tom's point, is that there is a point after which certain trade deals are going to happen in Asia. And it's not directed against us, it's not vengeful, it's just that it's going to happen. And then we have to deal ultimately with the consequences of either an RCEP or a TTP without the United States or a certain number of bilateral treaties that are made. And that's going to, have, that's going to change the shape of things. When we talk about Asia right now, we're talking about Asia the way in which the United States created it over several decades. Even the blocs, the countries, ASEAN itself. You know, who knows if ASEAN will have its coherence in 
uh, in five years' time if, uh, if it's pulled apart by Chinese and the U.S. and countries going neutral in the middle? That is a profound question yeah. for Southeast Asia, a yeah. profound question. Last word to you, Tom. I, I agree with that. Uh, fully. You know, I, I started at the beginning to talk about uncertainty, right? And, um, and, and events like, and, you know, and the, the president's obviously taken some steps to try to deal with uncertainty, and it's through the appointment of some very serious and competent and highly qualified people of high integrity. General Mattis, General McMaster, Rex Tillerson, and others. Um, but things like yesterday really undermine the, 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 and really kind of go to this uncertainty thing, uh, which, is, which is not what the United States wants to be, wants to be in the world. It was a, obviously a significant error, um, a, a serious self-inflicted wound. And, you know, my own experience having been, you know, starting in the, my first days in government in 1977, watching these, watching these movies, right, it almost ensures there'll be an independent uh, investigation. Of, um, of uh, the goings on during the during the campaign, the broader point that I wanted to make is about uh, is about Russia, though, uh, and I'm not sure um, that we've really uh, in the United States foreign policy community come to grips with where we are with Russia right now. Uh, and my own view uh, is that uh, you know we went through a quarter of a century of uh, undertaking an effort to integrate Russia into the Western economic, political, and security institutions, and I think with Putin coming back. In the spring of 2012, I think that effort uh, came to an end. And Putin doesn't, is not interested in integration. Uh, he's interested in something entirely different. He's interested in having Russia undertake an independent, uh, strike an independent pose in the world to basically define its foreign policy in kind of distinction or in negative ways as against the West and the United States. And we now see it, you know, we obviously saw it in Crimea and in eastern Ukraine, but it's broader than that. We see it in Syria. We see it in places like Libya. You see it in places like Afghanistan, right? You know, um, where we are in an actively hostile posture with the Russians uh, right now. Which, uh, you know, when, when great powers get into that posture, it's very difficult to get things done in the world. And that's the posture we're in right now. And I don't think that we've really kind of internalized that in the American and kind of in our foreign policy, uh, kind of in our foreign policy uh, at, at this point. Uh, which means that we need to do things like have a serious investigation uh, into. Uh, into the Russian activities in the campaign. We need to take very seriously what's really a, an effort as against the West at this point, of an information uh, warfare effort, if you will, to pursue the goals of trying to shake the confidence of the West, uh, to divide allies, uh, to embarrass the West, uh, to reduce confidence in elections and in democracy. And that's the real, I think that's the real challenge, I think, with respect to Russia. We'll go through, we'll go through all this stuff. Uh, and again, as I think the the president's actions in the last 24 hours almost ensure that this will get extended. Uh, there'll, be a, there'll be a series of investigations. There'll be an independent investigation of this thing. It'll go in directions that nobody can predict. Uh, we've seen these movies before. But the underlying problem that isn't getting addressed is really thinking through uh, the relationship between the West, the United States, and Russia going forward and how we confront what is essentially or deal with what is essentially kind of a hostile posture that we're in right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to thank first Tom Donnellan, who is the chair of BlackRock in Investment Institute and former National Security Advisor to President Obama. Bali uh, Nasser from coming all the way up from uh, Washington, D.C., Dean of Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Thank you, Bali. and the irrepressible Ian Bremer uh, uh, from uh, Eurasia Group, president and founder. Thank you for being with us at the Asia Society tonight. Uh, think about it hard, think about it long. Uh, make sure you come up with good answers for tomorrow. Good night and Godspeed.